construction of Sanofi Aventis uh, company uh, over 14 months, so a bit more than one year. The time unit was a month. And for uh, more than 250 references of products. So the product reference becomes an index like I, ranging from one to 250, and the month becomes an index from one to 14. So you see, you, you multiply all the indices and the more dimensions you have, you cross together. It comes from the Latin complexus, means interconnected, woven together. And so the more dimensions you have that cross together, and, uh, because it, you know, it, it is much better to solve 10 problems of, type, of size 10 than one problem of size 100. So if you can decompose the problem, it's better. But very often, you have mutualized resources. You could all together in the same model, and then it's a bigger problem. And we have tractability issues. So that's why we need math, we need modeling, and we need computer science to have powerful tools to solve our problems. Because in operations and supply chain, these are really problems with hundreds, thousands of hours. So the question I'm, I'm going to ask you is, uh, what are the, the key question is, what level of detail should you put in your model? to model that reality. First, there are aspects of reality that we cannot imagine. We're not, not going, going to be in the head of every potential consumer to, to, to know what his or her psychology is at an aggregated level. We cannot do that. So we have to make simplifications. And we have different planning horizons, operational, short, very short term, two model of the week. Tactical would be a few months, like production planning, inventory planning. And strategic would be in years, like from three years to up to 30 years, for the location of a nuclear plant or um, an airport, a highway, all these things with very large infrastructures and you cannot go back easily, okay? So the question I ask you through the chat, I hope you, it's, you can answer about your intuition is, for which kind of horizon, let's take the two extreme ones, operational or strategic. So operational plan for tomorrow, like the deliveries, Okay, uh, last mine delivery or strategic location of an airport or a nuclear plant. Is it for operational planning or strategic planning, short term or long term, that you need to the most precise model? That is my question. So please use the chat and just write operational or strategic. Okay, so uh, I will look at your results and I will give you. The correct answer because there is one. Okay, so I'll let you give, think a bit uh, like uh, 10 seconds about this question. Uh, do I need the most precise model for the operational level, which is tomorrow, or the strategic level, which is for a problem of that you evaluate among over several years. But let me sweep it. Okay. Let me strategic, strategic, operational, uh, operational, operational. Oh, it's quite mixed for the moment. Strategic, you can go on. Huh? I cannot uh, do the statistics about your answers, but it seems so. Two, three. Four, five, one, two, three, four, and then the chat. Uh, okay, a bit more for strategic than operational so far. Let me see the operational strategic, strategic. Uh, okay, a bit more. I would have wished a bit more answers to have a, a good statistic, but anyway, that's already gives some kind of a flavor of an intuition of your. Okay, the correct answer is operational. So first, why do, would you think it could be strategic? Because strategic means you, uh, you need a, actually, a, you, you, it's a question of a stress and fear of the failure. Because when it's strategic, so the manager, I think, would more often say strategic than the engineer. Why? Because the manager has in mind the, the financial states. What if I fail in my decision and it's a complete failure? then it could be a catastrophe. So to prevent myself from the risk, I want to have at, at most as the highest volume of data of, of, as possible, not to make a mistake. But the problem is that you don't have this data. When do you know who is working? When do you know what the product reference is? That what, what my daughter wants is a Pokemon uh, 
this kind of model, the puppet. This one with the, 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 the pink dress, but then the other one. It's tomorrow, it's now that you know. It's now that you know what is a precise demand for which kind of product reference. It's now that you know that this woman um, is not available these two days, or this man uh, cannot speak uh, Russian for, for the, the next flight uh, to go to Russia. Okay, so it is when you have the operational planning for tomorrow that you have to be very precise because you have individualized demands, employees, customers, products, individualized. When you are the strategic planning for 10 years, you don't even know which products you sell in, even in two years. Maybe the product, the reference will have disappeared. You see, so, so you, you, you aggregate, you aggregate. Meaning you have, you put all together, not as product references, but an index for a product, but tons or meter cube, and you have to aggregate. So for example, some, somebody from Aéroport de Paris said that for the traffic estimation, they estimate for 30 years. And they have grossly three scenarios, medium, high, and low demand of traffic. You cannot go very precisely. It's useless to have 50 scenarios because it's long-term, so aggregate. So you have less complex models for strategy. Then you should do robustness. You should do sensitivity analysis to the uncertainty. That's for sure. But on a model, which is much more simpler. And delivery, last mile delivery, vehicle routing, you know, to when you deliver the to your home for a packet, by any company, UPS, FedEx, and so on, uh, Amazon, they, they, it's a very complex model. You have to model the driver, which driver, which reference, when, what are the time windows of the customer? So it's a very complex. And the irony of the story is that the complex means very long to solve to get optimality. And that's actually where you have no time. You have to plan for tomorrow. So what do you do? You accept to have heuristics, which are methods that are maybe not optimal, but you have good reasons. And by research, we know that they maybe they are one, 2% from optimality, but maybe your data or data is not precise at one, 2%. So it's okay. Okay, so that's what we do. And we have more time for strategic planning. So very often it's very important to, to have accurate predictions and then machine learning, forecasting and anti, uh, artificial intelligence will be the thing that we teach in the master to make good predictions. Let me move on. Okay, yeah, to uh, my uh, case study because I wanted to. Uh, I first thought of uh, showing you a, a case that uh, we teach in our decision ideas course, which is one of the master two courses. But actually, um, it's it's actually actually the case of the course. I didn't want to reveal the solution of the case, so I did a, not a digital business, but Hinderscare case. Uh, which is, uh, let's say, let me describe a bit the case. Well, meanwhile, I just check the chat. Uh, okay, the question was precise and the level of detail, okay, in the model. W where do you need the, the highest level of detail? I just checked the chat. So Hinderscare is a company, let's say, uh, that uh, sells medical equipment. So let me move a bit here. Medical equipment. Uh, and they are in India, let's say, and normally they export through the Mumbai uh, harbor, which takes time. So the time to market, except India, is not good. So they want to settle in Europe. So here, it's a simplified uh, problem where you have in yellow circle, the potential clients, actually they are mega clients. So you, you concentrate all small cities into big ones, so areas, just to be simple, okay, for pedagogical reason, the true problem, we have many more clients. So here there are 21 clients in yellow, and there is this red square where there are possible sites for locating a facility. So what do you know? You know the distances between the, 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 the possible sites in, in, in red and the customers in yellow. You know the plant capacity, there are 11,000 tons. So that's my assumption in my case. So I have limited capacity for the, for the plants if they are constructed. And you have the customer demands where, of course, you need forecasting methods to predict the demand. That's not the topic of my master class, but of course we need methods and we extensively present that in the master. We suppose that you want to, you have the budget for constructing three plants. So it's expensive, it's several million euros for building a plant. So, so uh, and having it functioning actually. So for Indusquare wants to look at three plants, satisfy the customer demand by equality and respect the production capacity. 
not to exceed this 11,000 tons. So there's that big the, the problem. And I chose a problem where the model is not too large to describe. And you need a, a performance criteria to discriminate between different plans or different decisions or subset of locations. And I will choose, well, what makes sense for supply chain network design is to be as close as possible to the customer. Okay, so any, any main criterion of a supply chain would be close to customers, so which means that we minimize the average distance or the average time to the customer. It's a weighted average it's because it's over each ton. My unit, my, my, my unit is ton because I'm the strategic level, so I ag aggregate data, not considering any product reference by tons. Okay, so here is the data. So basically you have here in yellow, the 21 customers to be served in rows. In columns, you have the, in orange, you have the eight, one, two, three. So Zaga, Saragossa in Spain, Montpellier, Orleans, and Lens in France. Karlsruhe in Germany, Ljubljana, uh, Praha, and Budapest in the eastern part of Europe. And you should construct three out of these eight to supply all this. And you know the demand in tons, it's an estimation, of course. We should make sensitivity analysis. And there are two things in supply chain, whether it's multi-source means the demand can come from several factories or single source means 100% of the demand will come from the same place. Okay, so here's the decision model. So I'm gonna do a just math in this slide just to show you what it looks like. So you have, uh, this is a, this decomposition in five stages, one, two, three, four, five, is exactly the kind of, uh, the composition uh, of process that we use for decision model. So first we say, what are the different dimensions of the problem? Okay, so here the dimensions are the customers. I create an index I, 21, and the possible sites we're locating a, a hinder scare factory, and there are eight. So I put J ranging from one to eight, and I ranging from two to eight. These are the indices, and I have the data. The distance is DIJ, between I and J, and the demand of a customer I in tons. This second step, always in that order. Then in step three, I have the decision variables. And look, this is a crucial stage. That's why um, I put it in blue. So I have two kinds of variable here. I'm going to fast, going to be fast. But I mean, this exercise is exactly the modeling uh, a game uh, of the problem. So basically, what do you choose? You say for every uh, red square, which is a possible site, do you, yes or no, construct the facility there? Yes, no. So yes, no means it's one zero, like in computer science. Yes, no, one zero, do I build a plant here? Okay. And then you have another variable that is XIJ between I and J, customer I and XIJ, which is a percentage of the demand, because I said it would be multi-source. So what does it mean? It means the demand of the city of Lille can be can come, let's say, 40% from Orleans, 50% from Lens City, and 10% from, let's say, Saragossa. So you have to say the percentage of the demand that comes from, of the supply that comes from a, a given site. Okay, so here are the constraints. The sigma, the sum of the YK, which is the location variables is scale. I want three sites to be constructed. This is this constraint here, okay. Then you have the assignment constraints that say the proportion of the supply. So 10% from here, 50% from here, 40% from here. The sum is 100%, which is one. And that's exactly demand satisfaction. You have to serve 100% of the demand of each customer. And this is a constraint per customer. So it's very important to state for each index, you have the constraint, which is per customer. Each customer has his demand fulfilled. And then you have this, this constraint here that has the capacity constraint. So what does it say? It says the tot on the left-hand side, the total number of tons delivered by a given site J. So you sum over all customers, over all customers, what does it send to this customer, which is its demand multiplied by the percentage of the demand that you decide to serve from this site J, so DI, XIJ. You sum over all customers, you'll have the total number of tons supplied by this site to any customer, the total. And this total produced in the factory should not be then the cap more than the capacity. And what the capacity is? Well, if YJ is equals one, which means you open the facility, it is 11. So there's a mistake, it's 11,000 tons or it's zero. 
So it's linear. You can multiply by yj variable, and you have a right hand side, which is a capacity that depends whether you open it or not. And you know you open only three by this constraint. So five capacities will be zero, and three capacities will be 11,000. And then what you, what you optimize, and you minimize actually, is the total number of kilometers traveled per ton. It could be time in hours. You transform, if you know the speed of the truck, so you basically, you, you count the ton, ton, uh, tons multiplied by kilometers on the numer numerator. You divide by the total number of tons, which is a total demand on the denominator. And then this ratio will be a number of kilometers per ton, per unit, OK? So the average is not per customer, it's per ton, because you can have large customers and small customers, big countries, small countries. So it makes sense that you wait by the demand, because you'll do many more trips with a truck if you round trips, if you if, if it's a big demand, then it's a very small. Demand. So this is basically the model of the strategic planning. OK, and now. Uh, so I don't have much time, so maybe I will uh, look at the chat uh, once I finish my speech. OK, if I can see the So this is a, the, 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 the model. So it's a mathematical model. Uh, and you, you notice that everything is linear here in that case. Not everything is always linear. When you optimize the, 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 the gaps between the prediction and the real data, when you do pre predictive analytics, you put to square the gaps, for example, it's not linear. But here, it's linear. OK, so now uh, the solving. So let's do the solving, and then I, I do a bit of a PowerPoint so about the, the solution and then the analysis. So let me uh, share. Multi source. So let me do a new sharing. I hope it helps. Share. Share screen. Okay. I hope you can see my uh, my Excel file. If not, please use your microphone and and say. But I guess you you do see my Excel file. So now I, I show you just the Excel. So okay. So I've put multi-source before solving. Here you have the data, so the distances here, and the demands in blue, in tons of each customer in yellow. Right. Now, I prepared the spreadsheets. Of course, I just show you Excel Solver, but in, in real life, you have much more powerful tools, like C++, Guru, B solvers that can solve. First. But, but Excel is limited to 200 variables, which is actually close to the capacity of this problem. So here, I've put here, the assignments of the percentage of the demand that is supposed to be served. And actually, you know, I think I put that the model in tons. And here is the opening decision yes, no, one zero. So, uh, chat, yes, we see the file. Okay, good. Uh, let me put that maybe here, it would be better. And now I'm going to use the solver. So everything is prepared so that I don't lose too much time. I go to solver. Everything is then turned into the solver. So I said the objective function is the average time that is actually here, the average distance, sorry. So I said to Excel solver, this is the, the formula. So trust me, the formulas with uh, some products and linear functions, the weighted sums are inside the formula, the Excel file. I say I minimize. I define the variables are the blue ones, the ones the solver can change. And then I put the constraint. So what are the constraints? I say, uh, well, uh, the the sum, which will be here, of what is delivered to a customer is equal to its demand in white here. So K equals L. The capacity of the plants, so the total number of tons delivered by the site, which will be here, should be less than the capacity. And my sum of my blue variables here, the location variables, which is here, the sum here should be equal to three, meaning I build three. So I optimize. So everything is okay. I said it's binary also for the location variables. I struck, and in one less than one second, I should get the optimal solution. So here you directly see it appearing as tons. And look, uh, so what is the solution? So of course I need tools. Montpellier, Lens, and Praha will be the blanc, the plant speed. Okay. So with this demand completely done for Lisboa comes from Montpellier, from Madrid comes from Montpellier, 
you don't open Saragossa in Spain. So, so the closest one will be Montpellier, Barcelona as well, and so on. Because I have only three, of course, I can test if I have four. I will have a completely different uh, solution, uh, at least slightly. And you can see that it, it, the average distance per ton is 524 kilometers per ton, which basically corresponds to seven hours. It's very important to be less than day delivery for uh, e-commerce, less than day delivery. Okay. So if you want to reach that target, if you don't, you have to build more factories, maybe one more, or you do the warehouses actually. And you see that the capacities are limited. All are tight, except this second one, which I think is Lens, is just uh, used uh, maybe 85%. Okay, so you don't use a full capacity and the sum of the capacity should be more than the total demand. Okay, so if you, for example, if I change and I say, uh, now nah, I want four plants, I change it to the four here, that's all. And now it will put four plants so I can solve the game. Fine. And then I open Saragossa. Why? Because everything that was in Spain and Portugal was not very well served, was served at Montpellier, which was a bit far away. So now these, these customers are now served, Lisboa, Madrid, and Barcelona, by the Saragossa plant. And because you allowed yourself to have one more factory, you have more flexibility to scatter your locations to be closer to the customer, so you improve from 524 kilometers per ton to 471 to be closer to the customer, but it has a cost. So now it's a trade-off and science cannot help you anymore between what do you prefer between the investment cost of the plant, one, of one more factory, and the gain in terms of objective value that you have, which is you, you decrease the time to market is good, but also it's more costly. So you deliver, uh, of course, uh, quicker, but you'll have the price of the product Will, could be a bit higher. So if you're in a very competitive environment, that could be a drawback as well. So you have a trade-off to make, and management is a trade-off. But data certainly help. Okay, so uh, that's basically the like the Excel solver. So you see who serves who, and you can see that sometimes, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, what I had the thought but before is actually multi-source. So it's a line here. So let me now uh, give you a so let's go back. Oh. Where is my... Uh, uh, I don't see my... Uh... Okay, I hope it's going to be okay because I, I don't see my... Uh... Okay, it's, it's good. So let me share screen again. I ah, know, let me maybe um, have a bit of time. Let me maybe show you something else, which is uh, uh, an executive summary ask for the course that was made by some student actually. So just to show you, uh, let's share screen again. New share. All right, I hope it should be okay. So what can we say? Okay, let's, uh, so here you can visualize. It's very important to visualize your solutions. Sometimes you can't, but you should always have something visual. So here you have the maps of the three selected locations, Lens, Praha, and Montpellier, but you also have, uh, so the KPIs, you have all the assignments. So what are the flows between customers and the supply sites? And you can, Compute many other KPIs. What I ask to students is uh, not just the objective value, but many other. What is the percentage of capacity of the plant that is used? What is the average distance from a customer with closest uh, open site and so, and so on? So this is what the students did. A very good job, actually, of, by visualization on the map. So here you can completely visualize. This is a single source model. And actually what they did scientific analysis is, what if you have more sites? So instead of three, you have four, and you see how it decreases. Of course, the more factories you have, the closer you can be to customers. But at some point, there is not much gain. So at this point, you see there is just a marginal gain in the objective value, which is the average time. When you have one more site 
So you increase the budget. That's okay. Still okay, but at some sites you, you don't change much. So it's not worth. So you can look at the, the, the trade-off between the two criteria, number of sites with this investment cost and the time to market. Okay, and here is how the solutions change. You can see here, which site do you open in each case? So what it is as well, the, 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 did the sensitivity to the capacity of 11,000, what if I relax this capacity, I can build bigger factories. So of course, when you relax a constraint, you have a better objective value. So the time to market decreases this way. And at some point, there is no more impact. So it's not used to, to increase too much the capacity because you're already good. Mm -hmm. And then they also made sensitivity analysis to the customer demand. So what if it's plus 10%, minus 10%? Because I said you take aggregated data for a strategic level, but still there is a high uncertainty on the demand. So you, you must account for this uncertainty and take it somewhere in the model, uh, changing your data, your scenarios to see if the solutions are always the same, not just on one set of parameters. So when you change one parameter at a time, it's called sensitivity analysis. And when you change several parameters at a time, that's called robustness. In optimization, there is a part of optimization that's a new trend, let's say uh, more than 20, 15 years ago, which is called robust optimization. You want an optimization that is robust uh, with scenarios of deviations of your parameters. A very interesting field, actually. Okay, so let me now, uh, I don't have much time because I want to maybe leave a bit of time for questions. Uh, what else did they do? Yeah, limitation of the case. So, of course, you have always to be conscious of the assumptions. And once you get aside, you, you leave aside in a model because you made simplifications not too much, you should really give priority to the, to the main, the crucial components of your model. So what I did for supply chain could be the same for other companies like Amazon or others, but could be the same for telecom industry, could be the same for everything that has a network. But this kind of linear program, you can use it for production planning, you can use it to decrease CO2 emissions, many, many things. And could be non-linear. When you have the energy sector, the, the production functions are not linear. Uh, the demand, very often, when you do media planning, you want to optimize the audience and optimize your advertising campaign in marketing in different supports, different medias. The impact is not linear because you see the ad once, it makes you, you t satisfaction 10. Then you, you, add, you, add, you see it a second time, it doesn't give you 20 satisfaction. 10 plus 10, maybe it could be 10 plus 6, and then plus 3. So it's marginally decreasing. So it's not linear. So some phenomena is not linear, and you should be careful with that. OK, so let me go back to my, uh, hoping it's here, yes. Affichage, mode lecture. Uh, I think I should share, do a new share if it works. So. I think now it's time to conclude. Uh, yeah, I have five minutes. So, um, right. so here are a bit of conclusions. I want to move that because, yeah, fine. And that's going to go there. OK, so I show you some kinds of optimization models quite simply, simple uh, in terms of math because it's just linear functions in that case, but you have binary variables. And just tell me one thing is when the more binary variables you have, the more complex it is to solve by a solver. When it's linear and continuous variables are very quick. When it's nonlinear, it is so-so. And when you combine nonlinear modeling and zero one variables, that's really tricky. Which means what? Which means that when you have binary variable, the same problem with the same size could spend hours or days to be solved when it just requires a few seconds when you don't have integrality constraints sometimes for some problems, like the traveling salesman problem or others. So, conclusion. I hope I show you just for one example that we can use optimization tool to optimize KPI. So, what a KPI is, I don't know if you. You're in management, you know what a KPI is. If you're in engineering, maybe it's less clear. 
It's called a key performance indicator. So it could be the quality of service, the delivery time to customer, the cost very often and most often, the market share to maximize, but not always cost. I know a company, a consultant who did for a bus driver, a bus company, they wanted to balance the load of the drivers. Why? Because there was a strike, because some, it was very unbalanced. So some, uh, some bus drivers had, had very good schedules with concentrated things and are empty with free time for them. And others are, had a, a bus uh, schedule, then some, something empty for three hours, but they, are, they were left there at the depot. And then another two hours of work. Uh, whereas others finished the, the day sooner. So then they, they were not glad with that. So you can also optimize, minimize the, the variance of the load you see between employees or between customers. Um, but anyway, you can minimize CO2 emissions. So you decide the criteria. When I say you decide, that's very important. You are the decision maker. So there is science and actually rocket science in the solving in the, the algorithms to solve the problem, okay? So we had uh, very important algorithms uh, with decades of research to, to solve these problems, and that is mathematical science. But for modeling, modeling is not completely a science, it's an art, and it's a craftsmanship, what we say in France, artisanat, craftsman. You play, you realize there is a mistake in the model, you correct yourself, you ask, do you like uh, the model? Oh no, something's wrong with the solution. I don't like, oh, it means we forgot something. We forgot to create a constraint, we forgot some variables, and you discuss with the managers or the clients, okay? So you, you adapt the model. You have to do that systematically and continuously. Okay, now we need uh, good inputs for the data. So the data can be fixed data, a VAT rate, for example, is given. Okay, it's exogenous, I've control, but very often it's an uncertain data like, like demand. And then, of course, the quality of my decision will depend on the quality of the data and the forecasts. So we need good methods for that. Forecasting, machine learning, AI, and so on. Then the trap is to plunge into Excel or the solver right away. That is a trap. When you do this kind of modeling on the decision, you should think about how you, you consider your problem. What are the main components of the problem? What do you leave aside? What are the main decisions to make? What is the key data? What comes first? What is the most, the highest priority objective? Sometimes you have several objectives. You can't optimize many things at the same time when they are not the same unit. So you have to give priority to one and put others are constraints, for example. Which ones? Okay. So modeling comes always first. And the trap of students very often is to go to Excel directly, or of course the, the real solver, because Excel is limited, but then you don't see what happens. So I always advise to, to do the model first, the math, and to test your model on a toy problem to be with Excel, because you visualize on a toy problem with maybe only four sites and five products, you visualize you, the head of your solution. Otherwise you don't, you can't see. When you have an output file which is very large with hundreds of numbers so it's very important to validate the model first and then trust the tool the algorithmic tool okay concerning supply chain concerning supply chain time to market is key it was true for my problem but even more true for amazon for example uh, delivering is two hours would be a key asset delivering a half day so in the morning or in the afternoon and certainly in one day so what is the percentage of customers that you manage to, fer to, to serve in one day or half a day? Okay, now the, the point is also here, if you don't have very precise data, you shouldn't have uh, necessarily have a, you can have a very 100%, which never happens, okay? A 100% precise model compared to reality. You always, you cannot know the whole reality. Suppose you knew it, uh, be careful because it can be intractable especially if you have yes, no decisions, zero, one. Uh, you, can, you can grow, the grow the, the running time grows exponentially. So sometimes you have to let aside some aspects of the problem and give priorities to the key aspects of the problem. That's decision-making. That's making better de decisions than if you don't use models. And for these kind of problems, including this one of today, 
my intuition will not be enough. Very often it is, that's very well. You want to locate a, a lawyer uh, offices in Paris, you say I want to be in the 16th arrondissement because that's the place to be, very well. But for operations, sometimes for portfolio optimization in finance or assortment uh, in digital marketing, you don't see what to do. I don't, Einstein would not, nobody. So you put your intelligence into modeling. Okay. So detect the highest priority components. Then you have, you should always adapt the level of details of your decision model to the planning horizon. So remember that operational, so planning for Turo means you individualize the employees, what, so Mr. Dupont has to know what he's going to do tomorrow. Me, I want some specific products. I ordered two samples. I want them to be delivered between 2 and 4 p.m. tomorrow. This is exactly the problems, the, pro, the products I want. I don't want uh, in tons. I want exactly these two models. So you have to be individualized and so more complex, more precise data at the operational level. And you can aggregate and you should aggregate. You have no choice, actually, at the strategic level, because you don't even know who your employees will be in one year. You don't know which products you will sell in five years. So you have to be in an aggregated way. Okay, because the data is not there anyway. The data of five years is not there. So you aggregate, which makes simpler models in general. And I hope also to convince you it's very important to test the robustness of your model to uncertainty. Could be what are the key parameters that if you change them, they change completely the solution. Sometimes they change the cost, but not too much the solution. But if you change the solution, you have to implement your decision. And, and so it's important to detect which are the key parameters. Either they are, they are deterministic, no uncertainty, but key, or they have some uncertainty like the limit. Okay, so I hope I'm okay. It's, uh, we have 11 minutes left. So I finish with my talk. I hope it was clear. I didn't have much time, but I had a constraint, <laughs> optimized under the constraint to do the whole, the, whole, the whole thing in one hour. And now that I leave the floor to questions, so you can either use a microphone or use a chat, and I have 10 minutes to answer. So please don't hesitate uh, to ask questions if you, well, uh, if it's a general question about master DSBA, uh, my, my colleague, Professor Chevillon, at 2.30, we'll speak about the, the master. So I propose, I suggest that you ask questions about really the case study and the, this uh, decision analytics thing that I presented. So it's been a pleasure having you anyway. Uh, and uh, the, the floor is yours in case you have some, some questions. Ah, a question from Wing Xiang. Could you advise how the predictions still work for supply chain in the post-COVID era? Oh, that is an excellent question. So the problem of the prediction, so I, uh, I should adapt the prediction for sure to the pre-COVID versus post-COVID. Uh, I didn't focus much on the prediction part, but in the prediction, like uh, the, you have a forecast method for sales that is called uh, exponential smoothing. Lissage exponential in French, exponential smoothing. In this met method, you weight more or less the past compared to the, 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 the past data compared to the most recent data. So the, the method, the calibration of the, the forecasting method, put weights on the data of one month ago, two months ago, six months ago, one year ago, two years ago, and so on. So it does it automatically, but it depends on the training period, the training set, the training period that you choose for calibrating your model. So my advice would be that you, you have a training period that contains a large part of the, the COVID period, okay? So that you don't take the, the, last, the past four years because you will learn better based on a, on a, on a sample that contains a new phenomenon that you, that, that you have. So that's for aggregated data which are a bit more, or let's say, all the methods like exponential smoothing. If you want something individual per customer, may forecast about the intent of purchase, then you need more machine learning and AI techniques that are rather, I wouldn't say new, but uh, uh, very largely used now. Okay, uh, is there another question? Uh, 
uh, still hold in, uh, okay, let me see that. Gabriel Himmelheim. Okay, Excel for me is just has two main advantages. It's as a professor, it's a good tool for pedagogical reason because you see the results, you can explain with a tool that we know. And the second thing is for managers, they know Excel. So if you if they are not familiar with optimization and analytics, if you want to convince them of the power of the tool, you show them a toy problem, which I call a prototype, okay, on a small example, and you say, okay, look at what I can do, what, what I can save, 13% cost. What is the solution? Okay, is that what you want? So you agree on the model, and then you say, okay, trust me that for your real problem with 200 products, uh, 12 months, and so on, my solver will do exactly the same, but it's much more powerful. Well, it costs 15,000 euros sometimes for the companies. It's free for academics. But if you agree on the, the Excel toy problem, then you should agree that once we, okay, we repair, we, we adapt the bundle and so on, and then trust us that we do the same for the large size. So that's basically the interest of Excel solver. Sometimes it's enough. Sometimes it's enough, you have a small problem, uh, but when you do its operations, it's very rare, you have to be very variables. Uh, give me, a, I give you an example. If you have the cruise scheduling, you assign cruise to the flights, cruise with pilots, hostesses. So the variables then, the variables would be binary variables. Yes or no, do I use this rotation? A rotation is a sequence of flights from Roissy Airport. Then you have a flight, Roissy, uh, let's say Paris, Frankfurt, then a Frankfurt, Barcelona, Barcelona, London, and a London, Paris. That is called a rotation. Well, you have to enumerate all potential rotations. There are millions, okay? So you cannot use Excel solver. So we use uh, other, other tools. Sometimes you have to, to program, to code yourself the algorithm because it's too large, but you have a good, good idea and you test it compared to exact methods on the, on the solver. So, the, so certainly Excel is limited, but you can already have good, uh, good opinion on the model from Excel. Now I have the question with Luo. As you mentioned, the data and data, yeah, quality, yeah. I, so I, I read, uh, I cannot read uh, all, but I show you the question. We need to forecast the lead time or the daily date using the historical. I don't know what you mean by discrete and continuous data. Uh, I know what I mean by, by con discrete and continuous variables, which are uh, locations are discrete, zero one, and, uh, and productions or deliveries can be continuous, but continuous, Ah, you mean uh, maybe uh, day by day or minute by minute? Maybe that's what you mean. I don't know. But you have to make simplification. So very of often we discretize the time steps. So we say the data per, per month or per week. But if you want very short-term predictions, it's very good to... Uh, it's, there is a lot of value in, uh, in the data of one day when it's completely new. You will know which trend, which curve you are. So there is a lot of value. And then for the rest, uh, maybe I will need to know. I, I certainly agree with your remark and data quality is essential. Uh, but I'm not sure what you mean by discrete data. Maybe you, you mean over time maybe. Huh? So if it's over time, you, you need simplifications anyway. So you need to, to, to gather everything of the one, the one month or everything one day together. But if you, do you decide the time steps of day, that will be very much tricky than the months. I'll give you an example. I did some research for EDF, Electricité de France Energy Company. They had to plan the energy production, electricity production, for the 50 nuclear plants of France. So 50, multiplied by 100 scenarios of uncertainty because the weather, the, the winters uh, can be more or less hot or, 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 or cold, and then the electricity for the heating would, demand would be different. And then they compose for five years, but by weeks. And so the time steps was a week. So you multiply by 260 times steps because you have 52 weeks multiplied by five years, it's 260 times steps. So you see, the more you go to the detail, the more intractable is the problem, but the week was really needed. But they didn't go to the day, just the week, but not to the months. Okay, the question from uh, 
and universal. Okay. Thank you for the remark. For the decision analytics, typically, will it go through mainly on the math aspect or will there be exposure to different types of tools? Okay, so in that course, decision analytics will go to the math, but more to the modeling side. And we introduce a bit the, the algorithms, but just uh, uh, the main spirit of the algorithms. We do the solvers. And uh, beyond Excel solver, we'll show you like the CPLEX solver which was designed by the French company iLog, was bought by IBM now. And this is one of the most powerful. You have Gorobi, so we will show you other solvers. But for the decision analytics course, we don't know. We, for some problems like graph theory, we go to the algorithms, like shortest paths, dynamic programming, and so on. But for linear programming, uh, I do that in my pre-master course, but we don't do it in the course. But certainly, we do also the, uh, the math and the applications. Diego. Uh, uh, a question, and I think I have two minutes left, so I have to wrap up in two minutes. What is the best way to take into account if there, there are against the raised demand? Ah, okay. So what your question, Diego, is mainly for, I would say, more operational planning. So this kind of question does not arise at strategic level. But when you have to plan the level of a, uh, we do, we, we have to do that. So. My expertise in one is prescriptive analytics and predictive, but you should actually. Um, so there are methods to, to deal into, for example, on the social network, let's say on Facebook, an influencer makes a comment about the product, very positive or very negative. We know, and it's been observed, that suddenly just one comment by a very influential person can have a very high effect on the sales, at least at short term. And so you can be in shortage because this remark so you have to, uh, you know, the model can do it, but I would say the most uh, acute thing is to to have a, how do you say that, uh, uh, they uh, in English, I mean, the surveillance, I mean, a, a, a watch uh, system to, to check that if there, this happens, that's the first uh, to collect this uh, information, because otherwise you don't know. You will see a trend, uh, a high in remand, you don't know why, and sometimes it's due to, to this kind of comments. So yes, we do have tools for this. Uh, that is not my specific expertise for me, so I wouldn't dare to speak in place of my colleagues. But we do have uh, kinds of models for this kind of question, and that's a very accurate question. Which index of predictions may get wrong and how to fix them to ensure the productivity? Which index of prediction may get wrong? I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I don't know who asked the question, but uh, I'm not sure to understand the, which index of prediction. Uh, maybe I have one more minute. Uh, so if you take the mic, maybe I can answer, but I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't completely understand the question. But maybe, uh, uh, Miko, if you're here, uh, I think I don't want to be late for the next talk. So I guess I should leave the floor. And unfortunately, if you have more questions, uh, well, if you get to the master, uh, I'll be happy to answer. But uh, I guess I, I need to do, to do the wrap up because my, my colleague, uh, uh, Guillaume Chevillon, has, has a talk now. Uh, I can see that Guillaume uh, Chevillon, my colleague, is just entering the, the, the Zoom session. So I will uh, end now. So thank you for attending the talk uh, for the very relevant questions, actually, because that's the questions that we wonder ourselves. And now uh, let me say you goodbye, and I will leave the floor to my colleague Guillaume, who is there with the camera. So Guillaume, I finished, and I, I leave you the floor. And thanks, Laurent, and thanks for your talk. Sure. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I will start on from, from now. So thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Hi everyone, so I'm just going to let get ready. So welcome. I'm just
So I hope that everybody can see this. Um, and sorry, let's just. So welcome everybody. So after this talk by, by my colleague Laurent Fondari, who is a co-academic director of the uh, of the Master in Data Sciences and Business Analytics, and also a colleague in the uh, Information Systems Decision Sciences and Statistics Department at ESSEC, uh, I'd like to talk to you specifically about the, the master. Uh, just uh, the word of introduction. Um, I'd like to present myself, uh, Guillaume Chevillon. So I've been uh, I'm a professor in uh, statistics here at ESSEC, and I have been for. 15 years now. Uh, prior to that, I was, uh, I was in France a bit and then in the UK prior uh, to, to coming back to France. And I, at ESSEC, I've been also uh, in charge of uh, developing with our colleagues at Central Supelec, the Master in Data Sciences and Business Analytics um, at the beginning, which was uh, seven years ago now. We started uh, with Business Analytics and then Data Sciences and Business Analytics in 2015. And uh, with uh, Laurent Fondari, who joined a few years ago, uh, with the uh, two academic directors here. We have a, a team uh, entirely at ESSEC, and there's a complementary team at Central Supelec uh, who actually work with us. And uh, you may have seen that their names and uh, faces on the, uh, on the website of the, the program uh, Nikos Parayos and uh, Fakiskos Maliaros. Sorry, <coughs> Fakiskos Maliaros were the two academic directors. Um, a bit of history. We started with what was at the time called ESSEC uh, Ecole Centrale de Paris, uh, and then became Centrale Supélec when it merged with a different uh, school of engineering. And the reason why we, we created this program in, in the first year was because we think, and we have now uh, come to the conclusion that it was a, a very good insight. We, we, we believe that there is a strong need for people who are business savvy and tech, tech savvy and uh, data savvy right nowadays. So, and uh, we, we, we think that it's very important to understand the basic of data science, but also to know how this can be used and how to interact with people in different uh, sectors in, in, uh, in each company. So now in the next uh, hour that we have together, um, I would like to give you a short presentation of the master as it stands, and in particular with respect to uh, what is going on in Asia Pacific. And, and then I will open the floor to a Q&A, which I think is the most interesting, most interesting thing we should, should be able to do. So as a matter of uh, just background, our program is really kind of mixing data science, which is thinking out of the box technology to handle massive and sparse heterogeneous data, so really going through the method of uh, data science, Together with deep learning, you know, uh, reinforcement learning, and everything which now has become known as artificial intelligence, but together with a good understanding of the needs and the economic value that these technologies of these uh, scientific uh, developments can bring. So that really helping companies develop further, creating new companies, really understanding what is, is at stake, and this is very important because we're in a field. But a lot of people do not necessarily understand fully what they are talking about, and this is essential. And we have, you know, we have experience now showing that it's essential that people know what they talk about when they talk about data science, because this is really by knowing what are the capabilities, the deep, you know, deep rooted capability that you can know about the new ways to create new businesses, the new solution that can be brought forward. So that's essential. That's what we're trying to achieve here in this. Uh, in this uh, program. So just a um, very brief overview of uh, who our, our students are. And right now uh, we have about seven, 175 students uh, coming from 43 countries in total in the, in the program, uh, 27 uh, nationalities, uh, sorry, 34 nationalities in uh, M2 and 18 nationalities in M1. So M1, I will talk to M1 as a master one of the first year of the program, also called the two-year program, when you enter for two year in the in the program, and the and then that would be the master one, and then if you go for one one year only, uh, that would be the master two. As you see, we have more students coming directly uh, into uh, the one year program. So then we have together fifty five students in the two year program in the first year, and then they join an extra set of students coming directly in the second year of the program. So we have now 120 students in total in the second year of the program. And we have overall about 
I think it's really 50-50 between men and women. Uh, the ages range from, well, 22 to, to, to 30 uh, in general, so that whether it's the first year or the second year of the program. And people who enter directly in the, in the first year of the program, so the two-year program, the master one, we have roughly half of the people come from management, a quarter from economics, and the rest come essentially from, from sciences. And they are joined with other students, uh, so that in the second year, we still have roughly half of people coming from economics and management, and half uh, out of the 120 that come uh, from sciences. So sciences being very quite, quite large. So there's also like a bit of humanities here and communication. That's that's sorry. That's this bit here. They do over six percent and then two percent. Uh, GMAT. Uh, the median GMAT is above 700, and a GRE. Uh, we look. I'm only reporting the quant here, the quantitative uh, aspect here, really in the higher quantiles of the distribution. So out of 170, uh, the median is 167 in the first year, and 168 in the second year. And as you see, the people, our uh, students come from all over the world. Um, we didn't have so many students from, from Africa this year. It varies. Last year we had more. We, have, we had students from South Africa and other countries, but it, uh, it changes. And also Latin America, every year it varies, different countries, uh, different nationalities. Uh, lots of uh, people coming from Asia and also from uh, the Pacific. Now, where they studied before, I mean, uh, on the right-hand side, this list, uh, it's, it's a randomized list of, of, of universities. So you don't have to you know, make any, any sense of the, of the size of, of what it is, but just to show you the, where the students come from. So we have a, a wide array of, of, of students coming from, from different regions of the world. In terms of uh, ranking, just to let you know, in the if you take the average of the last three years, we have been ranked number three in uh, in um, the QS ranking for masters in business analytics. So that's only part of uh, of the master because we know we really have a, a strong component of the master which is in data sciences. So it's uh, it's something which is uh, more more technical than uh, the, the, these masters that uh, were at MIT and UCLA. And that's something we really care about here, that the, the strong mathematical component in data sciences is essential to, to, to our program. And it is also a master which is accredited by the French uh, Ministry of Higher Education Research. This is something which is in, very important for students that come, um, uh, that come from uh, any country where they, they, they may actually want to either stay in Europe afterwards or they come with a some subsidies from, from their state, uh, or they need to, to register for the, the, the level they've achieved when they want to go back to their countries. Uh, that is essential uh, for them, in particular in China. Uh, I know that uh, to be recognized um, as a, you know, the level of entry in your different jobs afterwards, that would be something very important. In terms of how the program is organized, essentially the first year is really based on foundation courses. So have you seen that a lot of diversity in terms of students coming in the program? And what we want to make sure is that everybody is fully ready for the second year and, and for their job afterwards. Therefore, the first year is really foundation courses. So it's very highly uh, intense in mathematics and statistics and coding, uh, starting from the first semester. Uh, and we also complement this right from the start from a good understanding of economics, management, finance, operations. That takes place at the University of Paris-Saclay. That's where the saint francis de is based. And then, then in the second year, sorry, in the second semester, students live, so it's not live in Sergi, they live in Sergi Pontoise, which is where the campus at ESSEC is. Uh, and then they move for, forward to the fundamentals of management, very much in line with our uh, historical program with the master in management. So that we, we learn a lot from, from our experience with the master in management. We don't use the core courses of, of that master and that we complement very heavily with anything dealing with statistics, mathematics, coding, and econometrics. Students also have a choice for elective courses. So in the first year, students are going to spend the first semester in Paris-Saclay, you know, campus at Central Superlec, and then they're going to move to ESSEC uh, in Sergi for the second half of the year. In the summer, there's an optional uh, internship that they, they, they may start. It's, it's only three months total between July and September, but you can start part-time uh, before the end of the year. And that consists of the first, the academic content of the, of the first year. And of course, 
I mean, I will go back to that in a minute, but we complement with a lot of uh, extra, extra elements such as masterclasses, hackathons, and, and things like that. In the second year, uh, our students go into specialization. So if they enter directly in second year, they have in September, well, actually starting late August, uh, they have the core courses uh, of refreshers, so it's like an induction for, for about five to six weeks, where they have seminars in business IT, team building negotiation, fundamental digital business, but also uh, refreshers, math mathematics, statistics, coding, languages, financial accounting, cost analysis, and so on. The point is to make sure that students who may have a different or diverse background are really up to the kind of up, up, up on track uh, when the core courses start in October, which was a few weeks ago now for the current cohort, uh, when you're going to have uh, seven core courses, uh, seven core courses which are about uh, forecasting and predictive analytics, which are about uh, big data analytics, which are about marketing analytics, at ATSEC, uh, at ATSEC, also machine learning, optimization, uh, deep learning and data, big data tools on platforms at Central Supelec. And uh, all of the courses are complemented by masterclasses in, that, in regulation, in ethics, in uh, security, uh, cyber security and data security, together with data design on lots of different, different masterclasses, company presentations, uh, and lots of events. Then uh, at the end of the first uh, trimester, uh, then students move to data sciences electives at Central de Supelec, and they will take them from January to March. And they have to choose, uh, well, at least three courses if they want a minor, and at least four courses if they want a major in, uh, in data sciences. They can have, a, I mean, two majors in total, so that's, uh, that's a possibility. And they can have more courses if they want to, to focus more deeply on, on those, uh, those courses. And they're really at the cutting edge of research uh, so they're really uh, very high level data sciences courses uh, at Central Superlex. So the, there's a very steep learning curve in, in this second year. Um, after this, they have a choice between uh, staying in Paris uh, for the business analytics electives. Again, a choice between uh, 10 courses that it would take in Sergi Pontoise, uh, just outside uh, Paris, the city of Paris. Or they can move to uh, our Singapore campus when they're going to follow a major in digital strategy, comprising uh, six courses with our faculty uh, there. I'm happy to answer questions uh, at, uh, at the end if you if you like. Or they can go either with a master in fintech at the School of Engineering uh, of uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, or with a master in Information Systems Management at the Business School of HKUST. That's our partner for April to June. And in parallel to all these courses from January to June, we ask our students to participate and to work for one day a week for, the, for six months, together with a team uh, of five students working with a company uh, that's going to provide data and under the coaching of, uh, well, we have ASX faculty and Central Superlex faculty together with professional coaches that make sure that students I do know how to bring value to the, to the company, not just solve technical problems. So a set of, uh, of business coaches uh, that are going to help them work in, par in partnership with this company for six months, bringing some solutions to the company. It could be a large company, a small company, that uh, many of them and students choose according to who they're, they're interested in. And, and the point of, of that is really to, to make sure that by the end of June, students have a full-fledged understanding on what it is to do data science in a company. So like a first-hand experience uh, that is really that, you know, deep, uh, goes in depth into the, um, in, into the understanding. So it involves, you know, a really kind of first-hand experience of data cleaning, but also finding solutions, bringing value on all these issues. And we have found, we have been offering this uh, CRP, Corporate Research Project, for a few years now, and we have found that they bring immense value to our students, in particular when it comes to uh, to the first uh, first experience afterwards. And then in the summer, we ask students to do a professional experience related to the topics of the of the of the master to make sure that they do have a first hand uh, personal experience dealing with data science and analytics. And the reason why we do that is because it's important that no matter what students want to do afterwards, they do have an experience of at least four months. Uh, in this field. It could be six months if they want, if they want to do internship. It can be a, a direct job 
uh, a pro full professional experience and a, a, a job temporary or permanent job if they want, depending on their backgrounds and they, depending on what they want to try. Often students like to do an internship, uh, even if they have prior experience uh, before the master and you've seen the range of uh, student, the range of ages is from 20 to 30. So essentially we have lots of students with a lot of uh, professional experience, but still internships are a good way to try out something uh, before committing. So that's, that can be useful. And then they, they provide a report uh, at the end of the professional appearance, and then the, the, we have a jury. So that's the second year, and the, the academic content at least. And the second year is complemented with, uh, well, of course, uh, events such as integration weekend with other students. Uh, we have inter-cohort parties. They can find and meet uh, the alumni. Uh, French languages um, courses for Lord and not native speakers. Uh, master classes, a one study trip. Uh, we've been to Dublin, Stockholm, Berlin. Uh, we were meant to go to Seoul in South Korea in uh, 1920, uh, but then uh, everything was cancelled. And last year, of course, we, we know the, owing to the pandemics, it has been impossible to, to travel abroad. So we've had events uh, in France, but unfortunately, uh, no international trip. Uh, for this year, we're planning to stay within Europe because of uh, visa requirements uh, by, uh, for students that are not uh, European nationals. And also because you know the borders are still um, quite volatile in terms of opening and closing, so we want to be safe this year. And the trip, the trip will be in February. Uh, we in first year and second year of the program we have data science hackathons uh, provided by partner companies. Uh, there are career fairs, uh, uh, access to career services, and uh, advisors, and lots of company presentations throughout the year. Uh, for both programs, and we also help with interview preparation for, for everybody. People want to keep their, start their own company, have lots of entrepreneurship uh, courses in the first year and second year, and so a module that allows them, allow them to reach, to be embedded into, uh, uh, into our incubators uh, after the, the master. Um, I'm almost reaching the end of this short presentation, and then the job so far, I mean, this is just a, no, only four bullet points, but uh, it depends. I mean, we've we have lots of alumni now, so diversity is very large. So I recommend that you look on our LinkedIn group, of, uh, which is ESSEC, Central Superlake, Master in Data Sciences and Business Analytics. If you look up on LinkedIn, you'll find it. But often students have put their experience either at two different masters uh, of ESSEC and Central. So um, that's also because their personal choices and they, they want to really advertise the, the two schools, not as a joint entity, but separately. Although. I think that there's more, you know, there's more value in uh, in bringing them together. But um, depending on what type of position they're looking for, afterwards they want to emphasize one or the other. So, so I, I do recommend that you have a look on LinkedIn to see what our alumni have become. But lots of them have been working in management consulting or analytics consulting, mostly as data scientists in that case, or um, people working with data scientists directly. Uh, the industry, or whereby the industry, I mean, also banks, insurance, uh, utilities, electricity, or, or anything uh, related to this, energy a lot. Uh, digital consulting, a specific internet companies, uh, you know, of course, Google, Amazon, and all this, but also educational. Um, and lots of students have started their own companies or have joined very small startups that were being built. So that's uh, an overview, and maybe it's time. Uh, for questions, that's, uh, I would like to leave the floor open so we have time for, to, to answer any specific questions because all this information that I've provided, you can uh, get it from the website more or less, but I'm here available if you have any, uh, anything you'd like to, to know in particular. So please don't, hate, don't hesitate. And I see, so I have yeah, different Q&A sessions here. So, um, and health and ladies, because of the legitimate projects or internships, yes, we have people, we have partnerships. And when I was talking about the cooperative research project, we've been working with uh, large um, hospitals in France and helping them uh, uh, streamline, optimize their processes. So that's, uh, that's something that is fully fair. I mean, of course, health is a very important topic nowadays. Um, so if you don't have a good grasp of French, well, you know, lots of our students don't speak French when they arrive, so that's very, uh, very standard. Um, then it depends on what you want to do. And you do, you mean, you don't have to be constrained by, by staying in France for your internship. It can be anywhere in the world. And we have students being uh, in many countries in the world during the internships. 
Um, so that's not a requirement. If you want to work in France afterwards, uh, students um, then, well, students that do not have a good grasp of French or haven't learned enough French uh, during the year compared to what they, they wish they had, uh, whether they've been a one-year program, two-year program, usually in a, after two-year program is no longer a problem, but uh, after the first-year program, uh, just one year, it may be, uh, still be um, not enough to, to get under, understood entirely. Then you can still work for any, you know, any company that doesn't require that, and it's quite common. I was meeting, uh, you know, we had the uh, inter-cohort party with the alumni a couple of weeks ago, and I was meeting lots of alumni uh, that joined France, not speaking French, and now they're now the one in particular was telling, telling me uh, that they were applying uh, for, for, for nationality. So, and they were not, you know, not Europeans or having no prior knowledge of French. So what, what I'm saying that they, they've been working in France with despite this, so it really depends. If you want to do a, a Saint's job, uh, working on English French customer, then it could be a problem. Uh, if you want to do management consulting uh, in a company that whose practice is organized with only a French, uh, base, but if they are you know, organized within Europe, it, it's not a problem. But that would be, and even though you know, any kind of analytics consulting, there's never a problem in general with the, the fact that you don't speak French. So I would not worry. Uh, do not hesitate to ask our student ambassadors if you, if you want to know about that. Um, but uh, in general, people find a way around. Well, you know, uh, which tech companies have a look on LinkedIn that's really the best because that's you know there now we have you know 300 400 uh, alumni from the master so um, so it's it's very diverse so that's why I just wanted to, to pinpoint that this it happens a lot so people have been working at Google at Amazon if you're just talking about that but or alphabet but it really ranges from very 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 small to, to very large so have a have a look on LinkedIn so research projects, well, we provide research, uh, research projects because we, we spend a lot of time working with the companies up front, making sure that the project is interesting, feasible, uh, and that the company would commit enough resources to actually helping our students work with them. So that's very important for us to be able to do that. Um, so the way it works, we've moved, it used to be in six months finishing in, in March. But uh, our experience is that, or for the last couple of years, is that these research projects are easy to, 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 to do uh, without actually going to the company regularly. So the way it works is that if you want to go to Singapore, Hong Kong in, uh, in April, June, then you start, you know, you still have uh, three months together with the company with a kickoff, which is in December, to, to interact a lot with the company physically in France and then you just finish the project with your team uh, based in Singapore, Hong Kong. And our experience in the past is that it was not an issue. Um, and were people working from wise and most students recently graduated from the bachelor. I wonder what, uh, what you mean by this, because when you see um, in the range of, well, people will enter in the first year program, so in a two year program, it is true that uh, uh, lots of people uh, go straight from the from, from the bachelor uh, because you know that that's a two year master in that case. The people who enter directly in the in the in the master in the second year, and many of them have have prior many most of them have professional experience prior to the master uh, and quite a few years in general. Uh, lots of them actually see see this master as. Um, an alternative to doing an MBA, which would be a very general master uh, program, but this is actually a master, which is, you know, it's like an MBA, but like for them, but targeted to data science analytics. So that's really a way for them to kind of harness this revolution, which is going on and making sure that they're on top of things after that. So lots of students have experience, even the people who enter in master one, so in the, who come for two years have some experience, but usually in that case, it'd be, it'd be often between one and three years. Uh, but it, it happens from time to time that people have got more experience. Uh, is French important uh, from the next anonymous attendee? Is French important to master uh, for better job prospects? No, uh, most of our students do not speak French and, and there hasn't been a problem so far. 
um, that they know often they, they that's also a nice thing about doing internship is that you you learn on the go as a, if you start with an internship like those students actually not I mean didn't speak much French when they started the internship and then they were actually making presentations in French after a few months of course the French is not perfect but you know it doesn't matter the point, the point is communication uh, and you see that um, it's not uh, in terms of communication Fran French is a complicated language when you want to write the grammar perfectly and I think uh, hardly any French person actually knows really how to, to, to write perfectly, but, uh, but in terms of communication or oral communication, it's not too complicated. So, so that's, uh, and reading also, so, so, so that's okay in, in general. Uh, and Luo, uh, Ruizie, uh, Ruizie, sorry, um, selection criteria for admission direct to M2. So the, the main difference between M1 and M2 is that uh, in M2, we're looking for people who are going to be uh, readily available to understanding everything that is going on, which means that you have to have uh, a good, uh, diverse background. Uh, it could be technical, but then you need to have uh, some professional experience. It could be non-technical, but then you have, it's good if you have some uh, technical experience and uh, you've been good in, uh, and we look at, uh, you know, you've been good in data sciences, Kind of applications so mathematics, statistics, econometric, whatever you have may, you may have done in the past, but we look at you actually look at the grades in every course that people have taken. We also look at uh, the motivation, so you have to be really motivated, and we also look a lot at um, your background. So what kind of extracurricular activities you have done? If you've done any certificates online, if you've worked, and hope usually people who enter the M two have either extended the internship experience or, or some work experience. Uh, and that's, uh, that's something we look very much into. So really want people that, that will understand everything, understand the depths of the, of the courses as well, uh, in terms of projection, projecting themselves into their future jobs. So that's why we, 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 we're looking for very well-rounded individuals in, in the M2. Uh, for the M1, you don't need so much experience because the point of the M1 is really to, to get you, you know, and get to grips with, uh, with, with everything. So there's a bit of a steep learning curve at the beginning in mathematics uh, for people who haven't done enough maths uh, in the previous few years and for whom maybe they have been doing something else so they want to get back. And the point of the, the M1 is really intensive for that to make sure that coding and the mathematics are, uh, are really uh, kind of, you know, you're at the top at the end. And also at the same time with finance, economics, uh, management, regulation and the world. And I, you know, IT, information systems management, all, all these topics, uh, you're going to do a lot during the year. So really, at the end of the year, you have the best of, you know, the best of the an business school and the best of uh, of a school of engineering related to uh, to data uh, courses. So that's really kind of how we conceived it. Um, uh, ta -ta -ta. Let's see me go. Sorry, so anonymous journal. So. Uh, how fast the graduates? Um, uh, how fast the graduates get hired or find jobs after completing a program? Um, in general, they all get. Uh, I mean, like the internships are straightforwardly easy to, to get. Uh, normally, the jobs are not a problem. Most of them get uh, an offer uh, before they finish a program uh, when they are doing their internships. Uh, some people. Uh, wonder and it's for some people it's not very clear whether they want to work for a startup or a large company so for the, some of them they take then they because they have a year uh, of visa in france after the completion of the of the program so so they so they they, they know they, they take a bit of time to 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 spend on interviews so some people like to to wait until january out uh, in the end of the second year to really uh, do the interviews. Uh, so in that case, you know, usually they get they get their jobs in a couple of months um, afterwards. That's what normally happens. But most people get them before they finish their professional experience, you know, the internship, for instance. Um, so that's the idea for the anonymous attendees. So Nish, sorry, Nishal Agawal. Uh, is it compulsory to have a management or on science background to get directly enrolled in the M2 or just a science background would be enough? It depends on what science background. That's, uh, if, it's, if it's something which is very technology oriented, but without any maths background, or and by maths, I'm being very, very, very broad here. 
uh, or if you don't have any coding background either, uh, then it's uh, hardly any coding background. Um, then, you know, for instance, if you don't make an, I don't know, I'm not, you know, mechanical engineering would be, uh, would still be, you'd, you'd have done a lot of math, but people have some, something really bad IT or electronics without too much ma mathematics necessarily or coding or a little bit of coding. Um, so that in that case uh, depends on the specific uh, person. So it's, it's hard for us to, to tell. What we do is like review all the candidates very carefully on a way we weigh the pros and cons uh, for all of them uh, of and joining directly in the M2 or whether it's better for them to join in M1. So we do this, this work of uh, evaluating everybody individually very carefully. And then, then if we think that you, the people are, are not yet ready for the M2, we recommend a, an admission to M1. Um, Gokul, uh, is it required to provide two letters of recommendation? Yes, uh, two letters of recommendation are required and we recommend at least one academic and one professional if you have had professional experience. Um, so if you don't have any professional experience, if you have never done an internship, if you haven't done any work with an association where they could actually uh, maybe uh, be able to, to provide a, a references, then of course, uh, two academic references would be, would be better than, than having only one. Uh, can I enter the master with a bachelor in psychology? Uh, well, it depends on what you've done, but we've had people with uh, different backgrounds. In particular, in psychology, that could be, you could actually have a, quite a technical background. Uh, psychology is very much about you know statistics uh, nowadays, um, so so it depends on it really depends on your specifics. But we've had you know we've had uh, every year and we have every year students who have a background which is not uh, necessarily uh, in the mainstream of what we what people might expect. So um, so yes, um, it would be possible. Sorry, I see that there's a chat and the Q&A. So I see also in the chat that see you uh, um, ask a question, but that was about uh, getting a job in France. Um, I think I've also already answered that, that question. Uh, so, so the point is like most students actually get a job in France, but many of them want to go abroad and don't want to stay in France. They want to stay, they go to Europe or, or somewhere else. So that's the question. So I'm going to close the chat for now so that we can stay on the Q&A uh, session. So Gabriel, uh, is there a limit on the professional extracurricular experiences you should include in your, in your application? Um, it's not, you mean an upper limit that you've done so much that you cannot share it. Uh, just, you know, you send us your CV anyway. So if you think that some, some experience is irrelevant and you have a lot of experience, then, then you and don't hesitate to share it with with us anyway. I mean, everything is relevant. If you think some elements are not relevant because they're too old, then no need to, to share. But don't hesitate to to mention them briefly without uh, you no know, or saying that you know there are lots of other things you don't uh, you don't um, you don't put down because it's too much. So I think this is the last question for now. So I think we can. Uh, um, there are no open questions, so we can uh, close the discussion. Um, if if there are no further questions, I hope I've answered everything. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out. We have student ambassadors that are there for, for helping you, uh, and that also um, uh, also in the admissions team, we have lots of people and I didn't have any, there was no specific question about Singapore, but uh, we're very happy that uh, like there were last year, uh, more than 15 students coming to, uh, to Singapore for the major. And at the time, May, Singapore was even open, one of the few countries in the world where uh, everything was uh, almost seeming, seemingly normal. Uh, so, so we have a good team in, in Singapore and uh, it's a great opportunity to also uh, get started in uh, the Asia Pacific region, and oh, lots of our students actually stay in Singapore or move around uh, close by to 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 start their careers. Um, then I thank you very much for your for question and interest and following, and don't hesitate um, to to reach out.
if needed. Thanks, Monique, and have a yeah. Hopefully, well, I hope that uh, get to see to get to meet you in person uh, uh, 